Working Preachers, it's Christmas. We know you are busy people. You have a lot of demands on your life. So we just wanted to take a special moment here to say, uh, we see you. We see you. We uh, are blessed by you. The church is blessed by you and the way in which you proclaim week in and week out the good news that we are hearing uh, this Christmas season, the good news of Jesus' presence and God's presence. So thank you so much. Yeah, and this year it's not even week in and week out. It's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, three days in a row for many of you uh, have services. And that's an, uh, a special w uh, experience of being worn out. I remember uh, my dad would often get sick right after Christmas just because of uh, uh, he's a pastor and getting worn down and your, uh, you know, your immune system is compromised. So thank you all for what you do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Merry Christmas. Thank you for going through the year with us and for the year with your communities and your people. We appreciate you. And even if they don't take the time, uh, they're showing up year after year for those who are only on Christmas attenders or week after week. There's, that's an expression of gratitude. So we thank you for all that you do to make God's promise, presence, and peace made known. Uh, to the spheres of influence you have. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is the podcast for Christmas Day, uh, which is always December 25th. Uh, if you are looking for a podcast on proper three, for which the gospel lesson is uh, John 1. You'll have to find that. Um, you'll have to find old podcasts. We're not doing one this year, uh, but there are commentaries on those texts available on the website. The readings for uh, Christmas Day are Isaiah 62, 6 through 12, Psalm 97, Titus 3, 4 through 7, and Luke 2, either 8 through 20 or 1 through 7, in, uh, or 1 through 20, I should say. Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless Merry us, everyone. Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. So this is this is going to be a, a pretty short podcast. Um, you can always uh, listen to um, the podcast for last night uh, or for Christmas Eve if uh, if you miss that one. But one thing about the the text, uh, the gospel text is the same for both days. Um, but one thing that uh, my attention is brought to uh, this time is verse seven, uh, if you're adding that verse, uh, which says, um, she laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. Um, the word that's translated as inn uh, occurs one other time in Luke, and that is uh, in the Last Supper. Uh, and it's translated there as upper room. And that's probably how it should be translated here. Um, Israelite houses had three floors and the upper room here would be the guest place. Think of Elijah, or sorry, not Elijah, Elisha, who would be the guest of a woman and that she had a room for him. Um, the idea is hospitality. This is a, this is a kinship based society uh, where the rules of hospitality required people to um, offer guest space. So I think the, the image here is that there were so many displaced people uh, in the town that all of the guest places were uh, taken already. So uh, a guest place was made for them, probably on the first floor, which is where the animals stayed at night. And so that's, that's the image. But to me, it's important then that um, the life of Jesus, um, well, it's already started, all right? Jesus has already been alive, but um, the first place then he enters uh, outside of Mary's uh, body is he, he is uh, a guest. And, uh, and so the laws of hospitality play a role even in the Chris, uh, Christmas story. Ralph, I really appreciate you making that focus. So many times uh, I've heard that uh, line used as a way to talk about uh, a, a lack of hospitality and, and a focus on, you know, there was no room and, you know, they, 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 you know, they uh, didn't care for this woman who was carrying a child. They didn't care for this couple who had traveled. And it's, it's uh, we miss it. It's, this isn't that, you know, there was no room in the Holiday Inn. 
Um, this truly is that in this community, they had everyone had received all of the travelers, all of the visitors. And so I really appreciate that you named this as an extension of hospitality, which is so much throughout all of what it is that uh, the creator is asking for the people of God, that we would be a people who extend hospitality. And uh, I, I hope that um, our, uh, Ed, that that folks that may have uh, been raised on the translation of uh, there's no room uh, would instead begin to focus on the fact that this is an extension of generous hospitality. And there's absolutely no way that going to family uh, for this uh, 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 traveling to your hometown, that they would have been abandoned. And so it is actually a, a, a generous extension of hospitality. Thank you for that. And I hope our listeners will attend to that. I'll just say I'm really skeptical. <laughs> so, <laughs> listeners, make up your own minds. <laughs> Uh, well, it's, 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 uh, uh, what is it? Um, oh, I can't think of his last name, but uh, uh, reading, um, I, I think it's the book, Reading Jesus uh, Through, uh, Rereading Scripture Through Western Eyes. Uh, uh, it's a correction of some of the things that uh, we've, we've done with those interpretations, which just give the background culture. Uh, that would be one. Um, um, I'll, I'll try to try to get the exact name of that in, in a moment. Um, and then and another one that uh, also looks at uh, the first century. Um, let me see if I, if I have that on Kindle, I can pull up those names. That's right. We can go to the Holy Land and I'll introduce you to some tour guides who will tell you that I'm right. So. Oh, oh I'll go with you for that lesson. I'm not going to resolve this, but yeah, it's, it's, it's you're going, we're going to see in the text what we want to see, um, which is usually what happens. But um, I'd say as long as we're, we're consistent like with where we go on this, Yes, misreading scripture with Western eyes, um, in which uh, was uh, uh, Randall, Randall um, uh, Richards. And there's another one by a name, uh, a fellow named Kenneth. Uh, yeah, I know that Bailey. one too. Yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. And there's one by right. a woman named Lois. That, that, that's another one. So we're not going to resolve it. <laughs> nope, we're not. But I'm. I'm going to go in a different direction, a homiletical direction on this text, uh, and that is the persons who show up on Christmas morning at Christmas Day service, I think are the ones who, who I, I think they're verse embodying verse 15 is what I think is happening. And that is when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the, he the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And so, so we hear the good news of great joy on, on Christmas of the birth of Jesus and, and, and what all of that means, but that then propels us it, it propels us to go and see that sign and to look for that sign in the world to look for that presence of jesus that 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 incarnational reality of jesus in the world and so i i hear i hear in in this particular verse the way in which the way in which the people who show up on once on on christmas day are are really kind of responding in such what then should we do what uh, where what does what will christmas mean going forward and it uh, really the way in which they are then propelled into uh, to movement and to see and to interpret the sign and what the sign is going to mean that it's not enough to receive the good news as it, uh, it, there is a called for, in a sense, response to go and look for it, to look for what this good news means, to look for how the sign is, uh, where it's pointing us in the world and how it changes how we, how, how we interpret the world. So that's, that's what I would, that's what I would do on this Christmas day and bring donuts or something because that's really great that they come people love that <laughs> and you won't have to get into the textual arguments <laughs> well and the other place it oh go ahead, Matt. go ahead 
Now, the other place I would go is I, I, I was going to say something on Titus last last time, and and we we ran out of time. But the the Titus reading, the way in which I I don't know. Again, I don't know. I would preach on it, but the but the way in which you can connect uh, Titus two eleven, and then also then Titus three four, which which repeats this idea of appearance. This that that God's grace in two eleven we had God's grace uh, is wait I'm going back to it just a second for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all which I think that could be a homiletical and maybe I would preach on it that could be a homiletical invitation to say how is grace being defined here what does grace mean one of those heavily you know the really jam-packed words that sometimes I, well, actually, oftentimes I tell my preaching students, you can't use in a sermon unless you're actually going to say what it means. And here we're getting a definition of grace that, that in, the, in Christmas day, that, that the grace of God has appeared, and then now in Titus 3, 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. And so this, this appearance of God is an act of grace itself for this entering of entering of God into this space and place is an is an embodiment of grace and so that's another that's another homiletical possibility that I hear this Christmas day 21 it gets to the question of you know what's being manifested here and this is one of the places where Titus is is really helpful in this language of a divine, manifestation both at christmas and also uh, where the book looks toward toward a future manifestation uh, i like uh for christmas day i like the noise of isaiah 62 uh, and the noise of psalm 97 there's both loud texts i think we've talked in the past before about uh these sentinels in isaiah 62 who aren't there to to quietly keep watch They're, they appear to be there to uh to scream <laughs> to remind god of things uh you know to uh, to never be silent. And so again, this idea of, um, of the rejoicing that rightly belongs on Christmas morning, but also the, the, the kind of fierce uh, effort to remind God of divine promises and to see uh, these promises of peace become fulfilled. Um, that shouldn't stop or we shouldn't let Christmas day be the thing that's like the, the release valve for all of the longing and resistance of Advent, um, but now begins, well, sometimes work, uh, sometimes a, a, a lot of prayer, a lot of expectations. Uh, and so to pull people into that uh, is easily done with these texts uh, as well that, that allow you to make some noise. It may not have any role in a Christmas day sermon, but uh, that sometimes prayer is, um, I like noisily, angrily, constantly giving God no rest, uh, constantly reminded of God's promises, especially in the context of Isaiah 62, uh, Jerusalem has been destroyed. So until he establishes Jerusalem, really should say probably reestablishes Jerusalem. Uh, and obviously the connection here is when does that happen? Well, that happens uh, in the birth of the Messiah. Sorry, Dre, go ahead. No, that's a perfect lead in. It's exactly the direction I was going to move from that. Uh, yes, it comes in the birth of the Messiah. And yet, it is not yet. Uh, Jesus uh, will grow up to say the kingdom is near and the kingdom is, is yet coming. And so Advent is not just the season of uh, rehearsing the, the uh, incarnation, but it's also a reminder uh, to anticipate the return of Christ. And it is in that expectation that we have the promise that um, uh, there, there will be this banquet, there will be this feast, there will be no more tears, there will be no more war, there will be more, no more death and disease. And, and that's what we want to keep praying for, to keep um, holding God accountable for. Um, 
um, looking back, uh, the noisy, noisy prayer uh, that uh, Hannah prayed, um, uh, the noisy uh, prayer uh, that uh, it is uh, uh, what Jesus will later teach about the woman who goes to the judge and won't leave them alone. Um, this, this Isaiah text makes me think of, of being that sentinel that says, God, you've made a promise. And we don't look and say, well, 2000 years ago, the incarnation happened. And have you paid attention to 2021? No, it's no, because you fulfilled the promise of the incarnation, we can believe in the promise of the kingdom yet to come. And I'm not gonna shut up about that. I'm gonna keep on calling God to accountability for that promise, to keep that promise until there truly is peace throughout all the earth.